Um, and it's a combined session with OR UK. My name is Nikki Evans and I'll be co-hosting with Ruth Threadgold, who's the Head of Education at OR UK. This evening, we're privileged to welcome Professor Duncan Tennant, who's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at St. George's Hospital. Um, and he's been there since 2003. In addition, he's Professor of Orthopedic Education at St. George's University of London, and Director of Education at South West London Elective Orthopedic Centre. In addition, he's an immediate past treasurer of BESS and a simulation lead for the BOA, as well as being a BOA, on the BOA Council um, and an examiner for the FRCS Trauma and Orthopaedics exam. Um, we also have um, Hannah with us this evening, who is with ORUK, and I'd like to welcome the other mentors, Mr. David Hughes, Mr. Hani Elbadisi, and uh, Mr. Mohammed Imran. So this evening, we're going to start with the um, presentation. And after the presentation, we'll have time for some questions um, and an MCQ poll for you to complete. Um, I'd ask you to write any questions in the chat box and we will monitor this and ask Professor Tennant at the end of his lecture. If you miss any part of this lecture, please don't panic. It is recorded and it will be available on the FRCS Mentor YouTube channel and the ORUK website in due course. Um, after the questions, we'll stop recording the session and we'll proceed to the Viva practice. Again, if you'd like to participate, we request that you raise your hand or identify yourself to us in the chat box, along with when you're sitting the part two exam. We understand that putting yourself forward for these Vivas can be intimidating, um, but it's really the best way for you to practice and we can rest assured that we've all been in a similar position. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Mr. Uh, Tennant for the lecture. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I'll just, here we go, and I'll share my screen. Uh, right, off we go. So, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Duncan Tennant. As you've heard, I'm a orthopedic surgeon, special interest in shoulder and elbow, and a professor of orthopedic education at St. George's. So I've been asked to talk to you about shoulder instability for the exam. And I'm aware that a lot of people won't necessarily have done a shoulder firm or a specialist shoulder firm. And some of the stuff in the textbooks is not great. So what I'm going to do is go back to the basics, because if you got the basics right, then everything else sort of follows on. So for those of you who do know a bit about shoulders, I'm sorry some of this is going to be a little bit obvious. Uh, but then we'll build it up from there. So if you've got a good understanding, the rest of it should be pretty simple. So I've got to thank uh, Anthony Herndon, uh, who was one of my registrars many, many years ago. Um, all the nice graphics you'll see of the shoulder are his. And uh, my colleague, Yemi Pierce, who's uh, I bounced these ideas off over many, many years. So we're going to look at a little bit about classification, um, look at about the, the anatomy. Uh, and how you examine, a little bit of investigations, and then we'll get on to the, the meat of it, which is how you manage them. Partly the management in the, in the fracture clinic. So what do you do with the patient in the fracture clinic, the day-to-day -day stuff? Um, and then a little bit more about the, the, the surgical management, which is more what comes up in the exam. So off we go. As you know, all the textbooks, the glenohumeral joint is inherently unstable. And you have to know about the static stabilizers, so the, the bone cartilage, the labrum, the fact that there's a negative pressure or ligaments. And as you'll see in a little bit, the dynamic stabilizers, so the muscles and the brain. Now, I'm not going to labor this. You're going to go look that up in the books. There's nothing very special there. But you need all of that stuff to make the, to make the shoulder stable. So if we look at classification, you can classify them in all sorts of different ways. And this is where people get really muddled. So just break it down. If you look at it on the time front, you can have acute dislocation, they're the ones in A&E, recurrent instability, and chronic dislocations. Now, we're not really going to pay any attention to the chronic ones. We're going to look at really, we're going to focus on recurrent instability. You can look at the mechanism. This is how you, the Ambry tubs, type 1, type 2, type 3 thing. And the direction. You talk about anterior, posterior, inferior, or multidirectional. Now, just to clear that one up, this gets really muddled in the literature, particularly if you read the American stuff, because in the UK, we recognize, if I show you an x-ray and you'll see one later on, of a dislocated shoulder, we call that an anterior dislocation. 
Now, a lot of the Americans got very confused because they said an anterior came straight out, inferior went inferior. And so the sort of things that we see that come out at about five o'clock must be an antero inferior. And therefore, that's multidirectional. And they got themselves in such a mess. Basically, multidirectional means it will come out the front and it will come out at the back. We're not really going to dwell too much on that. So let's look a little bit at the normal shoulder and the way the normal shoulder works and stays stable. So it has the bony anatomy, labrum, capsule, and some muscles. And as you move, the stretch receptors send a signal to the brain saying shoulders moving, the labrum's stressed, the brain sends a message back, the muscles contract and everything comes back into the normal state. And the stretch receptors uh, in the, in the capsule, that they're at both, basically both ends of the capsule, and they're really important for the stability. So if we now look at the unstable shoulder, um, and it gets very confused here. We all, you've all heard of Ambry and Tubbs. Yeah. Now, Ambry and Tubbs, you're taught is a spectrum, and Ambry stands for atraumatic, multidirectional, uh, bilateral, uh, the treatment is rehabilitation, and if that doesn't work, you can do a thing called an inferior capsular shift. And then there's, according to literature, this spectrum to tubs, which is traumatic unidirectional with a bank heart lesion, and the solution is surgery. And that's what everybody gets taught, that's in all the textbooks. The problem is it's, that definition doesn't give you a spectrum, it gives you two fixed points. So your patients either become one or the other. And what it tells you is if you don't, if in doubt, if you can't see a bank heart lesion, you get to operate anyway. Um, and this has caused all sorts of problems over the years. So way back in the dim and distant past of 2004, uh, Ian Bailey published his life's work. This is years and years in the making. Uh, the Stanmore Triangle, which is now most of you hopefully will have heard of. Um, and as a triangle, it's got three points. It's got the type one, which are the rugby players that we, we see, think about. It's got the type two, which are the, the gymnasts, the swimmers, the very bendy people. And it's got the type threes, which were the voluntary dislocators, the habitual dislocators. And that's been changed slightly. So we've got type one, traumatic, structural. And we'll talk about that. Type two, which are the atraumatic, structural. And type three, very importantly, are muscle patterning and they are non-structural which means there's nothing structurally wrong in there so let's have a look at it let's concentrate on the tight ones so here we go shoulder starts to move labrum fails you dislocate and get a hill sax so off it goes labrum fails you keep going and you dislocate and you're all very familiar with this and this is what i was talking about the the anterior or the anterior inferior dislocation. So hopefully nothing new there. Now you've got a hill sax, you've got a bank heart lesion. So off you go, you start to move. There's no stretch receptors now telling the brain to do anything. So you don't then have the reflexes to bring the shoulder back. It keeps going. It's lost its static constraints. It's now lost its dynamic constraints and out you come. So that is a fairly typical type one very common, 95% instability. If we look at the type twos, so these are atraumatic structural. And what we mean there is that these people are loose. Their collagen is loose and they can be all the way from the Ellis Danlos, just people who are a bit bendy. And therefore, the shoulder slides around all over the place and it has a feeling of instability and it may go far enough to dislocate. And then we look at the type three. Now these you need to get your head around a bit and you need to understand them. They're not as common, they make up about 5%, but if you miss them, you're in real trouble. So what do we mean? So when we talk about the shoulder, this is sort of what everyone envisages. You've got the scapula and it's nice and firm and it's solid. In reality, it's not that, it's that, a jelly. So here we go, it's a bit of anatomy. There's the shoulder some ribs, let's put some muscles on, so you've got rhomboids, serratus anterior, there's the clavicle, and pec major. 
And there's a few others in there as well that you could probably name. So what happens when the shoulder moves is everything's got to go in concert. So as the rhomboids and everything contracts at the back, pec has to relax to go with it. And vice versa, when the shoulder gets pulled forward, um, everything at the back has to relax. So everything has to work in concert. In the muscle patterning types, what happens is that the pec start, doesn't relax or it contracts excessively and it will pull the shoulder out of the joint. There are other patterns um, which are um, subscapularis or pec or that dorsi dominant and they'll do other things, but pec major is the main one. So pec contracts, it pulls the shoulder out of the joint. And what is peculiar about these people is that they, they can fully dislocate, they can do it many, many times, and they will not have any damage. There is a, it is non-structural. Now, they may want to do it, and it typically starts in adolescence, so they may start as, a, as the party trick as a teenager, because they go, look at me, I can dislocate my shoulder, and all the girls go, ooh, that's gross, do it again. Perfect reinforcement for a 14-year-old boy. After a while, they get a bit fed up with this. It's no longer cool, it's just annoying. And they want to stop, but they can't stop. And then there's another population who never wanted to start it in the first place, but it happens. So these are the muscle patternings. And if you scope them, there's nothing to see. Okay, so here we go. We've now got the three poles, and you'll notice I've taken the picture of Marty Feldman away, and I've put in a picture of the muscles. And what we know is that you're not fixed in any one corner, you can actually move around between them. So you may well be hypermobile, but if you fall off your bicycle, you can get a labral tear and vice versa. And in all of these, you can become muscle patterning. After a while, you start to learn funny tricks to keep the shoulder in. So you can have a bit of a blend of all of these. So it's important in the history to try and work out what came first? Was it the fall off the bicycle or did they actually have a problem uh, preceding it all? Okay. Why is this important? Well, what we know is surgeons can only operate on abnormal anatomy. All right. That means you've got to take away all of those ones in the corner, the type threes, because they haven't got abnormal anatomy. And if you want to destroy a shoulder, operate on a type three because you'll tighten it up and you'll wreck it. So if you're polar type one, we can fix the labrum. We know how to do that. If you're type two, you're baggy. And we can do a capsular shift. Now we know that if you've got really rubbish collagen, that's going to fail eventually, but we might give you the proprioception and we can talk about that later if you want. So what do you do with the type threes? It's really simple, physiotherapy but you need to give them the right physio. It's not rubber band and cuff strengthening exercises, it's brain training. So you've got to recognize it so that you can say to the physio, this is what you need to do, okay? So let's talk a little bit about clinical assessment. Don't really get bogged down in this. And there are a number of things you can do. Obviously you're gonna look at the cervical spine because you always do that. You gotta look at the range of motion normal versus the hypermobile shoulder. And sometimes you'll find with these people that they don't want to get all the way up to the end range um, because it feels unstable. Look at the scapular thoracic rhythm. And it's not something you can just read out of a book. You need the experience on it, but you can look at the scapula. Does it look like the other side or is it doing some weird S-shaped thing? Um, and then you get onto the sort of the hands-on thing. And it's important to know what the difference between laxity and instability are. So laxity is things like your sulcus sign and the AP draw. Okay. They are evidence that the joint is a little bit loose. However, that can be normal. Instability is a subjective feeling that the shoulder is going to come out of the joint that may or may not be associated with laxity. So you can be wonderfully lax, no issues, all right? Remember that, that AAP draw and the sulcus sign are not signs of instability. 
So for those of you who don't know, this is the sulfur sign. You pull up, you pull down on the arm, and you see the dip under the acromion. The AP draw, you glide anterior and posterior. And it may well be positive. It may well be negative, sorry, in a lot of people with instability because their muscles will tighten up. They don't like the feeling. And if they're big guys, I can't do it. I cannot make the shoulder move. Now, in terms of tests, there's really only two you need to know. And that's pretty well in the whole of the shoulder. The apprehension test, where you put your thumb in the back of the humeral head. You cock the arm up into abduction external rotation and you pull back on the wrist. So basically, you try to dislocate the shoulder by cranking it up, pushing forward with the thumb. The patient will tell you to stop. Or you'll see them contract or twitch. And they will go, stop doing that, please. I don't like it. And if you say, does that reproduce your symptoms? If they say yes, you've got your diagnosis. Of all the tests in the shoulder, it's the only one that's actually anywhere near accurate. It's about 90% sensitive and specific. Sometimes it's not very convincing. So you can do this marvelous thing, the relocation test. So what you do is lie the patient supine and you crank the arm back in the same way, but you push on the humeral head at the same time. So you're stopping it from dislocating. And then you take your hand off. And usually the facial expression changes very rapidly and they pull the arm in. So that's a Jove relocation test. Um, don't do it very often, but it's actually, it's, if you're not sure about your apprehension test, do this one uh, and that'll make the diagnosis for you. You then move on to investigations. And there's the usual suspects and we'll just go through them. So x-rays, there are lots and lots of different x-ray views you can take, the AP, pretty standard. Um, the axial view is certainly very useful, or the, or the lateral view to see if it's the things in joint. And then there are all sorts of funny things, the Bernageau view, which you have to get them to put the hand on the head and then point the elbow at the ceiling. Now, if you've got an unstable shoulder, it doesn't work very well. And then if you want to look for a hill sax, you can do these West Point or Striker Notch views. To be honest, we find in most departments, they don't know how to do these things. You're lucky if you get an AP. And as you can see on that x-ray there, yeah, there's a flake of bone. Now, I can't tell you whether that's a significant chunk or insignificant. So I've given up trying to do fancy x-rays uh, because you can get other things. Namely a CT. So CTs, whether you do them uh, 2D or 3D, 3D reconstructions, um, they're really good for bone loss. The problem with doing the things like the picture on the right is you need a an interested radiologist because they have to digitally remove the humeral head, which is a bit of an effort. Um, there are lots of different ways you can measure it. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but they're very good for measuring bone loss. CT arthrogram, very popular in, uh, in France. Again, it will pick up labral pathology, but it's, it's less good for bone loss because then when you're trying to subtract the humeral head and do things, the contrast gets in the way. So my colleague quite likes them. I, I find them a bit of a pain and they're invasive. MRI, it's great for soft tissue. Um, and my indication for an MRI is if I'm not sure about the history, I think something else might be going on, or they come to me and I've never got any proof. They say, oh, I've had 20 dislocations, never been to A&E, never had an X-ray. I've got no evidence they've ever dislocated. So I'll get an MRI in those situations. But it's good for labral pathology. But unless you've got a super duper high powered uh, MRI, they're not very good for bone loss. I wouldn't count on measuring my bone loss using them. And then the MRA, um, it's good again for those very subtle lesions. The people who've never had a dislocation, but they feel unstable. Uh, I'm not going to talk about slap lesions today, but if you think you've got a slap lesion, they're better for that. Um, and if you've got previous surgery, because to be honest, if somebody's had a failed stabilization, you look at the, the labrum or a normal MRI, you can't have no idea what's going on. So they're quite useful in that situation. So that's a gallop through the investigation. So what investigation you pick partly depends on local protocols. Uh, to my mind, as I said, if I 
haven't got evidence, I'll get an MRI. Um, otherwise, I'll get a CT scan because I really want to know what the bone loss is. So that's, that's the background. If we look now at the very basics, what do I do with the patient who sits in my fracture clinic? And that's not an unreasonable question to get asked. Now, for the exam, there are the best guidelines. And I'll run you through them very briefly. So we're looking at the first time dislocator up here. And if we run them down, you've got them in three groups. And you've got the under 25s, the under 40s, and the over 40s. In all of them getting going, there's no evidence that immobilizing people really makes a lot of difference. So if you look at the under 25s, if they've got bone loss, if you're worried about them in any way, send them on for second opinion. In this middle group, if they are symptomatic at three to six months, send them on. Now, in reality, that's not going to be you. You're going to send them to the physiotherapist and say to the physiotherapist, if they're still symptomatic, i.e. they re-dislocate, then they need a specialist opinion. Over 40, you start to worry about the rotator cuff because you have a higher incidence of cuff tear and therefore you don't want to miss these. You don't want to send them off and six months later, they can't lift their arm. So these ones you want to be thinking about, do I bring them back? Do I reassess them? And again, there will be local protocols. Do they all come back to a specialist clinic? Do they go to the physios? But be aware that that older age group are at risk. And then we move on to the operative management. Because this is something you get asked in your viva, and you're not expected to know masses. Broadly speaking, operative management, you can divide into soft tissue repair and bony reconstructions. Soft tissue repair, you break up into either an open bank art repair or an arthroscopic label repair. To be honest, there are very few dedicated shoulder surgeons doing open bank arts these days. Um, pretty well everybody who would call themselves a shoulder surgeon is doing arthroscopic surgery. On the bone side, don't get too bogged down. There are dozens of operations described. Um, and broadly speaking, it falls into do you do a latage in which you shift the coracoid and the conjoint tendon, so you're getting bone and a sling, or do you just put bone in, which is iliac crest, allograft, or even distal tibia? The evidence is that whether you do latage or the others, actually the outcomes are the same. There's a very good paper from a few years ago that demonstrates that. So you pay your money, takes your chance. The most common is the latage, um, but we'll see why there's some issues there. So how do you choose which one you're going to do? Because you may get asked in the viva, how are you going to manage this patient? And now you've got a choice, arthroscopic or a latage. So there is this thing called the ISIS score. Um, it's a French thing, and it's got these points. So it looks at age, sports, a type of sport, uh, hyperlaxity, um, and then some bone loss things. Uh, and if you look at it, six of those points um, actually come from age and bone loss. The sport thing and the hyperlaxity, they're a little bit soft in the middle. So really, if you focus on age and bone loss, that will help you with the majority of your, your base level decision making. So what are we interested in? So this again is from that, uh, it's from, from a different paper, you'll see the reference. Um, and it's got an age and risk of redislocation. And if you look here, when you're 15, you have 86% chance of having a second dislocation. By the time you're 30, that goes down to a 40% chance and then it drops from quite rapidly after 30. So lower age, higher redislocation rate. The flip side of that is as you get older, your risk of auxiliary nerve and rotator cuff injury goes up, but it's not quite so dramatic. So you would be more inclined to offer surgery to a younger patient because you know that they have a higher chance of redislocating or at least have that conversation. And when you're on, you know, 35 year old, you can say, well, your chances are a lot smaller. And bone loss. 
Interestingly, we don't know what the limit for bone loss is. Nobody has done the study where they said at 10% bone loss, you're going to become unstable. Um, but what we do know is that if you operate, you need to take bone loss into account. There are lots of different ways of measuring bone loss. And again, you don't need to get too bogged down, but most of them, most of the ones that most people use are done on this circle of best fit. So you draw a circle that pretty well represents your inferior glenoid and you measure the bit that's missing. Right? And there's the PICO technique, which most people know the name of, or Sagaya. It doesn't matter as long as you say circle of best fit uh, on a CT scan. And that's why I get the CT scans. So how much bone loss is important? And this is a paper, again, if you want to quote papers, Burkhart and De Beer in 2000, uh, in 2000 said, well, actually, we're really good at doing arthroscopic stabilization, but some of them fail. And they realized that if you had 25% bone loss or an engaging hill sax lesion, we'll come to that, you stood a 67% chance of failing your stabilization surgery. But because they were good, if you didn't have a bone loss, 4%. So that's a massive difference, and this woke everybody up. So there you are, there's your cutoff. It's 25% is the magic, was the magic number. Um, again, if you get into this, the number's coming down to about, uh, at the moment it's about 16%. And when you do the maths on that, 16% of the 32 millimeter glenoid is only a couple of mil, it's not a lot. The other thing you need to be aware of is this concept of engaging lesions and what's called on track, off track. Unless you are really into this, do not go and look it up. Because that picture A there from the original uh, the Giacomo paper, what you have to do is you have to work out what your normal glenoid would be and work out what 83% of it is. That's your normal track. You then take your your defect, you take the defect in the humeral head, you, you do some funny maths on it, and it gives you a calculation. Don't even go there. All you've got to know is that if you've got a big hill sax, you may not need such a big glenoid lesion to enable the thing to dislocate. And you've just got to be aware of it. So mutter tracking, on track, off track, and assume that the examiner will know less than you do about that. So, for those of you who don't know, this is basically the steps in an arthroscopic stabilization. There's lots of different ways of doing it, but you, effectively you pass a stitch, you anchor the stitch into the bone, and you repeat two, three, four times, depending on what you want to do. The latage, very simply, you take the, the coracoid, and again, there are the congruent art, non congruent art, doesn't really matter. Um, you apply the coracoid to the front of the glenoid bang in a couple of screws. You can either reattach the labrum and the anterior capsule, as you see in picture C there, or you don't, doesn't seem to matter. And that works very nicely. However, it has some complications. Um, you can get osteolysis and you can see the picture of the, the CT scan there. It's one of mine. Um, it was a beautiful operation. Came back a year later going, yes, yeah, not quite right. Bone disappeared. Um, and then when the bone disappears, you get the picture like the arthroscopic one down at the bottom. The other thing you can do is you can put your graft in the wrong place, as you can see on the drawing, and you can put it too high. So it abuts on the humeral head and abrades it. You can put it too low. So there's lots of technical things. And this is the list of complications of the latter shape. Now, in that list, they basically said 30% of latigees get a complication. Now, I think that hematoma is a little unfair. Um, the neurologic injuries, the majority are in neuropraxia. However, there is a steady trickle that end up up at Stanmore um, with the peripheral nerve injury unit where they have permanent uh, muscular cutaneous nerve injuries. So these are young guys, mostly athletic, no biceps. Um, and you get chronically, you get subscapularis failures and subscapularis and scapula, sorry, dyskinesia. So you can end up with some long-term problems in this operation. It's not benign. Um, so to wrap that little bit up, 
And I really have galloped through the, the broad brush strokes. Think about your classification. Is it a one, two, or a three? Now, your money's going to be on a one, but you've got to be very wary that you don't miss the threes. Your investigations, you've got to see what your local preferences are. But really, you want to know what your bone loss is. Because the bone loss is going to dictate how you manage this ultimately. And then your operative treatment, and whether you're going to offer surgery, obviously it's based on each individual patient, but your conversation is going to be tilted by, uh, by age. Now, if you do an arthroscopic stabilization with no bone loss, uh, or less than, I put 20% there, for me it's 16%. You're looking at a 90% success rate, phenomenally low complication rate. Latage, great, 97.5%, whatever, 98.5% uh, success rate. However, 30% complication rate. So you've got to weigh up the, the pros and the cons. Um, you can reduce some of those if you do an iliac crest, which is what my preference is. Um, however, you're knocking chunks out of somebody's iliac crest, and that apparently hurts a little bit. So again, and also you've got the osteolysis and all the rest of it. Um, so that's the sort of the gallop through anterior instability. Now, I thought I'd talk just a little bit about posterior instability because, again, it's not taught very well. And this is just a few slides. So there are lots of mechanisms. We all know about the fits and the shocks. Remember that although fits and shocks are far more common cause of posterior instability, the majority of those will still be anterior instability. But remember, the fall on the outstretched hand, the direct impacts. Um, and these are also part of the, the multi-directional thing. And there are, broadly speaking, two forms. There are the acute dislocated ones that as I imagine the majority of you have come across. They're the ones you get called to A&E because they say there's a posterior dislocation. Hopefully, before they've tried to reduce it, so they're not trying to sell you a posterior fracture dislocation. And then there are the more chronic labral things, which we'll talk about, which get missed. So the acute dislocations, they have this loss of external rotation because it's locked, they can't move, right? I'm not gonna tell you how to diagnose them, the light bulb sign and all of that. CTs are very useful. Be very wary about trying to reduce these in A&E because your chance of fracturing something is pretty high. If you do reduce them, remember, that you need to brace them in external or neutral. If you put them straight in a sling, they end up dislocated again. So for these are the ones that are back to front, so they need to be externally rotated. If you do it open, and so you may get the scenario where they say, okay, you've tried to reduce it in a &E, it doesn't work, you're gonna to go to theatre, what are you gonna do? You're gonna try close reduction in theatre, muscle relaxant, all that sort of stuff. And the question that catches everybody how are you going to approach this? And the number of times when I ask this question, somebody says, I'm going through the back. And you know full well they have no idea what they're talking about. This is an anterior delta pectoral approach. And just gen that up if you're not too familiar with it. You go in through the front, you find the rotator interval, open the rotator interval, and you're looking into the cavity, which is the glenohumeral joint, and you'll see the glenoid. You then get a bone spike, and you very gently lever this thing out of the joint muscle relaxant and all of that on board. To stabilize it, the traditional is a thing called a McLaughlin procedure, where you take the lesser tuberosity and you plumb it into the defect with screws or suture anchors. The other alternative, which a lot of us favor now, leave the lesser tuberosity in place. You've opened the rotator interval, you can put one of these anchors down in the defect and you pass it through subscapularis, which is right in front of you, and then you tie down, so you run plissage the subscapularis into the defect. That's quick and easy to do. But you need to be aware, so the words you need to know is delta pectoral approach, McLaughlin procedure. Okay. Now, the posteriors, uh, the posterior label things, these are different. These will get missed, and you will all have missed them. They're rarely unstable. And these are often the rugby players or people who've fallen heavily on an arm, put their hand out, or they the shoulder charge or something like that. They get burners, stingers, dead arms. And they're the sort of people who will happen at the beginning of the season. They'll have a week off, settles down, they go back, play a game, they're okay, then they'll do it again. 
and they keep going around in circles. And the physios go, oh, yeah, yeah it's a burner or a stinger or, you know, it'll be fine. Um, it's not. If you load the posterior labrum, this is Job's posterior load test, um, or a posterior glide, quite often there's a click um, and some pain at the back of the shoulder. And if you get an MR or an MR arthrogram, you will see either this appearance where the posterior labrum is off or this little thing, which you just need to know the name of, which is called a kin lesion, where the labrum is intact on the top, but it's got a hole underneath. Symptoms are the same. Now, what you do with them is up to you. They're not like the anteriors where they're, they're going to dislocate, they're just uncomfortable. So you can leave them alone, but actually this is what you see. So this, the, the MRI picture is the same patient as that one. So it doesn't look too bad on the MRI, but that's the appearance. It's completely shredded when you get in there. So if they don't settle, one of your options um, is to stabilize them. Well, lots of different ways of stabilizing them. This is the way I prefer, because this is the way we described. Um, basically, you do a posterior label repair. It's honestly, it's easier than an anterior. There's much more room and it. it's pretty straightforward stuff. So just think about posterior label tears. In the clinical practice, they're more common, they're impact injuries. They give you this dead arm um, and you get these posterior uh, label repairs, pretty simple stuff. So that's a little gallop through that. And that's all I want to say about instability at this stage. Quick plug for these books, which I can thoroughly recommend. They're actually very good if you haven't already got them. Uh, and a quick plug for ORUK, who do a huge amount of work. Um, so in all that spare cash that you haven't been spending on your booze over lockdown, um, you can chuck it Ruth's way. So thank you very much. And hopefully we will have some questions. And I'll stop my share. And um, thank you, Prof. That was a um, very comprehensive lecture. Um, and hopefully all the candidates will feel a lot more confident going into their exams, having gone through all of that. Um, I do believe we have some questions um, from the chat box. Um, Hani, do you have the questions? Uh. Uh, what is is Issa Muhammad is asked about uh, what is off track and how to cal to calculate in reality? In reality, it becomes very difficult. So I glossed over it. So first of all, you have to measure the glenoid defect. Um, then you have to measure the size of the hill sacs lesion from the edge of the rotator cuff to the edge of the lesion. And that gives you that distance. You then measure that length you calculate what 83% of a normal glenoid would be, and you need this 83% and you work out the track, and if your two numbers overlap the 83%, you're, you're considered off track. To be honest, unless you're really getting into shoulder instability uh, as a consultant, don't waste your time on it. Know that it's a combination of the hill sacs lesion and the anterior glenoid lesion, and that's all you need to know. Personally, I don't use it. I measure my glenoid, I eyeball the hill sacs, and that's enough. Okay? So don't, okay. don't waste any sleep on it. Okay, we have another question from uh, Omar Ahmed. Uh, do you advise for EMG testing when you doubt of polar three? Um, no, is the short answer. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis. Uh, if you are experienced, you put your hands on, you watch the patterns. Um, and there are, there are pretty simple patterns and you can pick them up in about two minutes. The problem with the EMG is you have to do fine wires um, and trying to get a fine wire EMG in subscapularis, I've had it done to me, it's a long way in. Uh, so no, we don't tend to do EMG, it's clinical diagnosis unless it's really weird and then you'll do it. Okay, and it is uh, Barisa uh, Safi. Uh, she asked, how do you diagnose the three S? as they will not have any abnormalities on the scan. Will they have similar exam finding? Um, again, no, they, they will give you, it's a, a lot of it's the history. So if there's no history of trauma at all, then there's something going on. And when you examine them, 
you will see that the pattern is different. So you will see pec major contracting, it'll flick. Um, or as they come up, the classic one is the posterior instabilities and they lift the arm up. And as they get to about 140 degrees, there's a clunk. Okay. And actually what that is, is the shoulder has come out of the joint and it clunks back in again. Um, and if you watch the hand, and it, once you've seen one, it's blindingly obvious. They often turn the hand into internal rotation because subscap is pulling them into internal rotation. And if you externally rotate them on the way up, you cure them. So it's a very different thing because you see the pattern, whereas most type ones have a normal rhythm. It gets difficult when you've got both. If you've got an abnormal rhythm and a labral pathology, then you've got to unpick it and that becomes quite subtle. But most of the time it's, it's a history and a straightforward exam. Okay. So another question, uh, can you re-explain the on track, off track concept? Very briefly, and I won't answer the question again. <laughs> um, what we realized with Burkhardt back in 2000 was that bone loss was important. Um, and we started measuring bone loss. We then, uh, with uh, Giacomo and Atoe, said, well, hang on a minute. It's not, when you, as you di dislocate a shoulder, it's that combination of the hill sacs and the, the glenoid. So if you've got a massive hill sacs lesion, you may not need a very big uh, glenoid lesion. And so Giacomo did all sorts of clever maths on it. He came up with this number of 83%. So it's a combination of the size of the hill sacs and the size of the glenoid. And when you hit this critical number, it's deemed off track. In practical terms, about 95% of shoulder surgeons don't formally measure it because it's not very accurate. And really you need a CT scan to measure the glenoid and you need an MRI to say where the cuff is to measure the other. So you're doing two investigations to measure something. What I will do, I'll look at the hill sacks and go, oh, that's a biggie, I better measure it, or I won't. Okay. Yeah, and if you've got 20% bone loss on the glenoid, it doesn't matter what the hill sacks is doing because you're gonna do a bony operation anyway. And if you haven't got any bone loss, you're gonna be hard pressed to do anything to the hill sacks. So don't, it's a there, it's a phrase, nobody is gonna ask you to explain it. Absolutely guarantee that one. Okay, the last question is, uh, uh, always he said like, uh, in many of the locked post dislocation, we do reverse shoulder. Is that the best option? You gotta go by your patient. If you're 25 with a locked posterior dislocation, I think if one did a, a reverse on that, that's negligent. Okay. If you're 85 with a locked posterior dislocation, you would have shredded the rotator cuff um, and then, yeah, it might be a reasonable thing to do. But for the ma vast majority of patients, I, I don't think I've ever had to do a reverse for a locked posterior dislocation because they're only locked until you give them a general anesthetic and unlock it. Yeah. And when you unlock it, you look at the, the humeral head. Now, if you're talking about the chronic ones, then these have been out for six months or something. There's usually something majorly wrong with the patient. Okay. But the acute locked posterior dislocation that may be a few days old um unless the patient is biologically awful don't do it the other thing you've got to think of is if you've got a lot if you've got a posterior dislocation we gave you that list which is fits shocks and you've got to include, include the alcoholics so they're, they're fit do you really want to put a large piece of metal and some screws into somebody who's going to have another fit because you can see where that's going to end up so short answer is rarely and certainly not as a standard procedure. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. That was the last question. So we'll go okay. to uh, Nikki now. Yeah, thanks, honey. Thanks, Prof. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the MCQ questions. So I think Ruth gives us about two minutes or so to answer them. If you can answer them for us um, so we can see, test your understanding of um, the lecture. Thanks, Ruth. Okay, I'm just going to finish the polling now. Prof Tennant, if you'd like to read through, uh, take us through the answers, if that's okay, please. Uh, Do you see those? Right. So, yeah, so we've got the first one as a 16-year-old, uh, plays rugby, dislocates his shoulder. 
um, comes to you and they've chopped off the last word, but uh, I think everybody worked it out. What do you think the chances of having a further dislocation? So the majority have gone with 80%, which is correct. Yeah, so remember from the lecture, um, that table, and at the top of the table, we had the, the 15, 16 year olds, and they had you know, an over 80% chance of recurrent instability. And if you drop down, it gets lower. So a couple of you may have, have just got that confused the other way around. But so young people, bad outcome, probably related to uh, where their collagen is, is made. So the next one is 23 year old woman, uh, recurrent instability, you get a CT scan and it shows 25% bone loss. And she says, I don't want any scars, I want arthroscopic surgery. And so you have to advise. And the question is, what would be the chances of failure that you're going to tell her when you do an arthroscopic operation? And well, almost half of you were awake because that Burkhart and De Beer paper said 67% failure with 25% bone loss. Okay. So a few of you being a little pessimistic, going up at 77%, either that you, you don't trust your skills. Um, some of you there being a little bit optimistic. Yeah, so if you do an arthroscopic stabilization and you don't address the bone loss, it has a high chance of failure. And that magic number, 25% bone loss, 67% chance of failure. And then everyone was asleep, well most, no, everyone was awake, nearly. If you're going to do a locked posterior dislocation in theatre, it's a delta pectoral approach. Now, I know some of you seem to want to do uh, reverses on them, but to be honest, that's few and far between. Um, so the vast majority are going to do a delta pectoral approach and reach around the back. Yeah. Whoever put the direct posterior approach clearly heard the first part of the thing and then fell asleep for the rest of the talk, the rest of the, of the slide. So it's a delta pectoral approach. Don't go around the back. If you think about it practically, it ain't gonna happen. Okay. So most of you got that. So those of you not sure, have another look at the lecture. Um, the answers are all in there. Okay.